Jesus, love and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the same. Good evening, church family. Thank you for joining us for our Wednesday evening Bible study. If you're one of our guests online, we're glad to have you. And if you're from the Knoxville area, we would love to have you come and visit us in person when we resume meeting in person on June the 7th. Before we get started with our Bible study, I have several things I want to cover with you tonight. And yes, I'm coming to you from, I guess what I would call the loft area right below where our steeple is located. If you've ever wondered what it looks like, well, this is it. There's a lot of dust, there's a lot of duct work, and that's pretty much all there is. So now you've seen it. If you would look up, you would see those uh, vents that you can see from, from our parking lot. But anyway, just wanted to give you a peek at some places you might not ever see in our church building as we begin our time together tonight. Want us to focus in on the folks who are in need of our prayers right now. Please remember the McKee family as Mike is going to have surgery tomorrow, uh, heart surgery tomorrow. Also, Robert Ball and Melissa Henderson are still struggling with their health. Also, David Rawlings is recovering from his surgery last week. Uh, Michelle Burke's husband, this is also Jenna and Jared's father, Alan Burke, was in the hospital uh, recently for some heart issues. He's now at home, but we need to continue to pray for him. Wayne and Becky Doan's son, Matt, had a stroke, and uh, Tristan Sherwood's father, stepfather, Russ Reinhardt, had surgery last week. And also, we need to continue to remember Jackson in our prayers as that young man is battling for his health. And then we would mentioned the safe arrival of the Simcox baby, but little baby Zane is having some serious health struggles right now, uh, and they are monitoring him closely, taking care of him. So let's uh, continue to remember the Simcox family and, uh, and little baby Zane especially. And we also want to remember the McCreary family. Uh, E.T.'s mother, Edie, passed away. They're going to have her services uh, tomorrow, so we need to continue to pray for them. And good news, the Sains greeted a, another grandchild, uh, Kaylee Sane was born, and we're so uh, happy for them uh, and the arrival of, of Kaylee. And then Grant Weekly was baptized uh, last Sunday morning, very early morning. Uh, made the decision that he needed uh, to become a Christian and uh, was questioning his decision before, and so wanted to make sure he had the opportunity to make that right with God. And so we're so thankful for Grant's decision to become a Christian. By way of events, I want to remind you briefly, there's more information again specifically in the We Rejoice online bulletin that you should be receiving by email about the King uh, baby shower, the virtual baby shower we're having for Dominique and Jenna King and the arrival of baby Nora this summer. Also remember the volunteer service that we have, the communion kits that are still available the next couple of weeks as we're still worshiping online uh, only, that you can come by the church building and pick those up. Our virtual VBS, this is something that we're going to try new this year because we're not going to be able to have an in-person VBS. We're going to be filming Bible stories, Bible crafts, uh, singing, those kind of things, and releasing those each Wednesday night in the month of June. That's our plan for right now, and very excited about that. It's going to be a new way of doing that, uh, but hope that you'll be uh, looking forward to that. If you'd like to help with those skits, maybe you can contact Billy Bearden, and I know that he would appreciate that help. And then, back by popular demand, next Wednesday night, May the 27th, is going to be Quarantine Bible Trivia Night. So I know we had a lot of folks that really enjoyed that last time, so we're going to bring that back next Wednesday. It'll be the last Wednesday before we're able to meet again 
uh, before we start meeting again. Of course, our online, our Wednesday nights are going to continue to be online, but this will be the last Wednesday before uh, the last Wednesday of this particular quarter. So we're going to do a Bible trivia night, work just like it did before. Uh, everything will be online. You'll just need to have pen and paper in hand. You can do it as a family, you can do it as an individual, and then just let us know what your results are and see if you can do better than Mark Burroughs 17 last time. I think we're going to have 20 questions again. So 17 is the mark uh, to beat this next time. I mentioned reassembling again. The elders have let us know that June the 7th is the date that we're going to come back together again. But it's not going to look like it did before. And what, we all need to prepare ourselves that things are just simply going to be different for a brief period of time. And we can do anything for a short window of time, can't we, as brothers and sisters? The elders have graciously said, hey, we're going to try this on June the 7th. We're going to divide into two identical worship services. One will be held at 10, one will be held at 2 p.m. They'll be the exact same worship service. But we're going to be dividing and, and figuring out who's going to go to which service by use of our connect groups. So there is information in the bulletin about this, but we're going to be sending more specific information to you, including reminding you which connect group that you were in. You may have forgotten that uh, because we didn't, we didn't really get a chance to do a lot with those before we had to dismiss because of COVID-19. So you will be receiving more specific information about the things the elders are requesting of us, about the way this is going to work. So be looking for that. And in the meantime, as we think about this, remember as we come back together, we've all been enduring the same storm, but we're in different boats. Some of the folks that may decide, that they may decide that it's not time for them or for their families to return to in-person worship. That is perfectly fine. You have the right to make that decision. And if that's the best decision for you or for your family, please make that decision. For those who, will, who seek to return, some of us will be a little more anxious than others. We need to respect one another during this time. We need to respect that while we've all been in the same storm, it's been a very different experience for each one of us. And some of those who come back may still be a little anxious about things. And so we need to give each other some leeway. I like what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verses 19 through 22, where he reminds us that just because I have the right to do something, doesn't necessarily mean it's the best thing to do. I like what Chuck Webster said uh, earlier this week as he was talking about the struggles that some Christians are having with making the decision of coming back or wearing masks or, or all these decisions that we have to make. This is what he said. He said, when this pandemic is over and the history books have written, I hope that Christians will be known for our standing up for the well-being of others more than the standing up for our rights. As Christians, we are called to consider others more important than ourselves. So when it comes to the issue of things like wearing masks, I'll be wearing a mask when, on June the 7th when we assemble again, because I want those of you who consider that to be very important to feel comfortable around me as I spend time with you and as I talk to you at a physical distance that is safe for both of us. As we are engaging together, those we're making decisions, as you're thinking and praying about this and about the decision for you and your family, please know that the elders are praying for you in making that decision. And our hope is that it will be a, a great day of rejoicing for those that are able to be here and for those who will still be worshiping online at home. Either way, we're going to have a chance to be together again on June the 7th. I'm so thankful to God for that and that He's brought us through this, and you should be as well. But let's remember to consider one another during this time and be patient with each other. God bless, and it's time for us to begin our Bible study. Have you ever had trouble sleeping at night? And I'm not necessarily mean like you have a, some kind of sleep condition, but that there's just something weighing on your mind or your heart so deeply that you cannot get rest. Maybe, maybe you're excited. Maybe it's something positive. You're excited about something that's coming up, and so you just can't sleep that night, and you're ready for the morning to break so that you can go do that thing. Or you know, maybe you're concerned about something or somebody, and you've lost sleep all night long. Or maybe you're agitated, you're angry about something, and you've lost sleep over that. You know, we lose sleep for any number of reasons, and I know that I have my share of lost sleep for any number of reasons. But as we turn to the fourth psalm tonight, this psalm is presented as an evening prayer where I think as we study it together today, what we'll find is that it is, it's the psalmist explanation for how to have a good night's rest. Now, I'm not speaking medically here. There are 
there are sometimes very serious reasons why people cannot sleep and insomnia or uh, uh, breathing issues or depression, any number of things that cause a, a loss of sleep that are medically important for you to have checked out. But what I'm talking about is just in our everyday lives when we lose sleep over things that matter to us. They're that pressing in our lives. The psalmist, I think, gives us some hints. He encourages us to think about some things that might help us to have a better night's rest when we have those everyday occurrences where life is just pressing down on us. So as we begin our study tonight, we're going to begin with the superscription, which we often have in this study of the Psalms that soothe the soul. And when we look at the superscription this time, it says that it, this is a Psalm of David that's given to the choir master and is to be performed with stringed instruments. And we'll have to remember that David was a musician. What it appears some of these Psalms are is that they are prayers that David had prayed at some point in time that he had set to music. Now, we would say, well, this is the inspired Word of God. And so God, of course, is, is, has inspired him to do that. But these seem to be quite often very personal prayers, things that are going on in this person's life, but that other people could relate to. And we see that all the time in, as songwriters will write things that really come out of their own individual lives. But, but when they set them to music and, and write the lyrics, they, they resonate with all of us. And I think this psalm is one of those psalms that can resonate with us. And maybe right here and now, in the middle of this pandemic, you've not been resting well. And I can imagine a lot of us are, are facing that right now, that we're just not resting well because of all the uncertainty and the stress and the concern and the anxiety that comes with something like the pandemic that we're in right now. So my hope is that this is the study of this psalm, Psalm 4, will, will help us uh, to, to maybe deal with this a little bit better. Quite often it is called an evening prayer psalm, which is a beautiful depiction that we'll see at, towards the end of the psalm, I think will help us to understand why it's often called that. Uh, this evening prayer is, is a prayer offered by a person that's probably much in the same circumstance we're in, but maybe something even a little more serious. They're struggling with the fact that there is some kind of enemy at the door. And how do they deal with that enemy at the door? So as we begin looking at this particular psalm, Psalm, ver, psalm, psalm chapter 4, let's take a look at verse 1. He says, answer me when I call. And I want you to pick out the three imperative statements that are made by the psalmist. There are three ways that he calls out to God. And he says, answer me when I call, O God of my righteousness. You have given me relief when I was in distress. Be gracious to me and hear my prayer. Those three imperatives that we find there are the, he says, I want you to answer me. Now, this is not probably phrased like perhaps my tone made it sound there just a moment ago. Answer me, God. It's it's more of a, I'm crying out, I need you to answer me. And haven't we seen that over and over again in the study of our psalms, especially these psalms that are, to me, designed to help soothe the soul, that a person is crying out to God with an expectation that God is going to answer them, right? That's part of that faith formula that we've looked at. He says, I want you to be gracious to me. And we're going to see a little bit more how he depicts that in a little while. Be gracious to me, uh, you know, uh, Take care of me in this situation. And then the last thing he says, I want you to hear my prayer. And one of the things that we've seen over and over in the Psalms that we've studied in this course of the study is that quite often uh, the psalmist will cry out to God expecting and knowing that God is hearing them. And that's an important thing for us uh, to understand is that God does hear our prayers. And he says that you are the God of my righteousness. You know, righteousness is something that God can bestow uh, and then righteousness is something that we can exhibit. And in this case, the psalmist is, is crying out and saying, you know, God, you, you can do what is right. You do what is right. And so that's what I'm, I'm proclaiming is that you will continue to be righteous in what you do and share your righteousness with me. One of the interesting things about this at the end of verse 1, and I'm not sure that most of the, like the word-for-word -word translations always do the best job of translating this, uh, like in the ESV, if you look at the second half of verse 1, he says, You have given me relief when I was in distress. And that, that is a beautiful picture, but it kind of misses the nuance of the Hebrew there, according to scholars, who all come back and say, well, really, kind of the picture there is that he feels like he's being squeezed. He feels like that the world is kind of pressing in on him. And if you have ever lost sleep because of a very serious situation that you're dealing with or a decision that has to be made, and maybe it's not a pleasant one, you feel that, don't you? You feel that weight on you, so to speak. You feel like life is squeezing you into a corner or pressing you to make a decision and there's pressure there. 
And that's really the picture that's being given. So a couple of newer translations or paraphrases of the Bible, I think kind of give a, a neat depiction of this. One is uh, the Passion Translation, which there are a lot of people that have a lot of issues with it, and, and probably rightfully so. But I like the way that they have given this word picture, given life to this. It says, I'm being squeezed again. That's what the Passion Translation says. The Message, which is another paraphrased version of the Bible, says, Once in a tight place, you gave me room. I like that. I like that depiction because it, it gives sort of something I think we all can relate to, that we felt that pressure before. And in essence, the psalmist is saying, in the past, I know that when I felt like I was in a tight space, you helped give me breathing room. When I was squeezed and the air was being squeezed out of me, you gave me room to breathe. And that's what we all want. If you've been in that situation, that's what you want. You want some relief, right? And the psalmist says, God, I look to you because I know that you can give that to me. Be gracious and hear my prayer. Please provide for me what it is that I need at a time like this. And right now I just need some room. So as we go on to verse 2, he quantifies for us or kind of gives us some insight as to why he is crying out to God. And, and quite often this has also been a formula uh, in our study of these psalms that soothe the soul that the reason they're crying out to God is because there's something specific going on. And so in this case, he gives us, he tells us what the problem is. Look in verse 2. He says, O oh men, how long shall my honor be turned into shame? How long will you love vain words and seek after lies? Again, here's what we have. We have somebody who appears to be an enemy in regards to they are maybe saying slanderous things about the person. Uh, they are presenting something falsely about them. And what I find interesting about this um, is that, once again, people are the problem. And quite often in our lives, people can be problems, not all the time, but they can be. Um, the way that the psalmist speaks, in, in the next several verses, by the way, it, it's hard sometimes to decipher whether he is just talking to God or is he is also kind of talking to God and, and talking to these enemies all in the same way, in the same, at the same time. Um, because the, what he's doing here is he's, he's kind of asking them, hey, he's asking them a question, how long are you guys going to do this? And he's doing this in the course of a prayer, but his approach to his enemies is what we're going to hone in on here in just a few minutes as we read a couple of verses. And the way that he handles that, I think, is, is part of the key for us when we're agitated, when we are upset, and we're trying to find some rest, that we can remember these lessons, and it will help us to find that peace that we really want in those circumstances. You know, I, I think if you're like me, there are times where maybe you're engaged in prayer with God or you just know that you're about to have a very difficult conversation with somebody and so you rehearse it. You, you ever done that? I mean, I have. So I kind of rehearse it. What am I going to say to this person? How am I going to say it? And, and when you do that, you know, you, the idea is you want to kind of develop a good train of thought. You want to kind of have your talking points down or whatever it is to be prepared in that situation. And it seems like the psalmist is doing that in the middle of this prayer. And what he's doing is really he's kind of talking to God as he is theoretically, you know, talking through a discussion that he'll end up having with his enemies a little bit later on. And so in verses 3 through 5, he starts to kind of ponder what that's going to look like. So beginning in, in verse 3 of Psalm 4, he says, but know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. So again, it's still as he's talking to God, but he's also talking to these enemies. But are they going to hear this, right? He's really talking through this of what it feels like. But know that the Lord has set apart the godly for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Be angry and do not sin. Ponder in your own hearts on your beds and be silent. Offer right sacrifices and put your trust in. And the Lord. And again, it seems like he is talking to his enemies as he talks to God. And he's saying, Look, guys, there is a better way to handle this. And really, as he's talking to his enemies, I think there's also a reminder to himself. And if you've ever talked through a situation before you've ever gone to talk to somebody about something difficult, maybe it's your boss or a, a supervisor or somebody that you supervise, and you're going to have that, you kind of talk through that. It's more so really for you than it is for them, isn't it? You're trying to keep yourself calm. You're trying to figure out how you're going to address this situation without blowing up. And maybe that's exactly what's happening here. Is it's not necessarily for his enemies. He is talking to his enemies, but it's really more for him. Because he doesn't want to act on emotion. He doesn't want to blow up 
in this situation, even though these are enemies that are, are coming, saying false things against him and, 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 and uh, causing problems in his life. He doesn't, he doesn't want to be a problem in their life, is really what it sounds like. And he offers this reminder to himself and to them. He says, be angry and do not sin. Of course, we read that later on in the book of Ephesians. Be angry and sin not, right? We're not supposed to give the devil a foothold. And that bitterness, that anger that can set in when we have been done wrong, if, if we just will stay bitter and stay angry at people, it's like mixing up a poison and feeding it to yourself. That's really all that we're doing there. And so he says, don't act on emotion. Now, we often we talk about forgiving people or um, the idea of how do I get past something where somebody has wronged me. A lot of times it's, it's difficult to do that and we think that it's impossible to, to move on from a situation because we still have emotional reactions when we see those people. And I'm here to tell you today that sometimes that is, it's impossible to, to move away from a situation when you're only shortly removed from it to expect yourself to not have an emotional reaction when you see that person again. I don't know that that's reasonable to request that of yourself. You're going to have emotional reactions when you see them, but it doesn't mean you have to act on that emotion. We have a conscience. We have a teaching. We understand. We have choice. We have choice in the matter as to whether I'm going to be, you know, just, just give in to my emotions, or am I going to think about this in a different way? And that's what the author wants us to do. He wants his enemies even to think about this in a different way. He's telling them, hey, you guys be angry, but don't sin. Ponder in your hearts. Think about this. Meditate on it. Pray about it, right? Ponder in your own hearts on your beds and be silent. Sleep on this. Yeah, sometimes people say, well, we shouldn't go to bed angry. I don't know that that's always possible to do. I'll just be honest with you. Let's, let's be real, okay? But that doesn't mean that if I go to bed angry that I, I, I can just go to bed angry and just pout. I need to ponder things. I need to think through what's going on, what's happening, and why I reacted that way. Why am I so angry about this? Why is this hurt so bad? And process and work through that, right? And pray to God about that like this person is. And then come back and try to find some reconciliation. Because look at what he says. Offer right sacrifices. Put your trust in the Lord. I don't think he's praying just for himself. I think he really wants what is best for those people that have wronged him. And that's the second part of this is, well, if he really is praying about this situation with his enemies, is that what we're supposed to do? And I'll remind you, there are a couple of passages that we often look at, like Matthew chapter 5 and in Romans chapter 12, where Jesus tells us that very thing. In fact, let's take a look at one of those in Matthew chapter 5, in the Sermon on the Mount, right? That great passage of Scripture where Jesus gives us so many practical things for, for living as a Christian. But beginning in verse 43 of Matthew 5, You have heard it was said, You shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Right? That sounds right, right? That sounds natural. But I say to you, Love your enemies. And that's that, agape, that's that agape word, agapao is the verb of that. The idea is it's I want what's best for them. Love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For He makes His Son rise on the evil and on the good and sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you greet only your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You therefore must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. And again, that word perfect doesn't mean we're going to get it all right all the time. It's the idea of be mature. Be the bigger person, right? But how do I love my enemies? What does that mean? Well, he tells us, pray for those who persecute you. It's exactly what we see happening in Psalm 4. He's praying for those people that they'll do what? That they'll turn, that they'll change, that they'll listen to God, they'll trust in the Lord, and they won't be angry and they won't sin. He wants what's best for them. Jesus doesn't always give us commandments that are easy to follow, but He gives us the right commandments to follow. It doesn't mean they're easy. What happens when we will pray for our enemies? Praying for our enemies, here's one thing that it does. If we'll pray for our enemies... It will humble us into remembering that at one time we were enemies of God. Romans 5.10 It will remind us that I'm not so perfect, that I need forgiveness, that I need help, I need guidance from God. It will encourage us to see those individuals through God's eyes. Remember 1 Timothy chapter 2.4 reminds us 
that God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. If I'm harboring bitterness and, and, and har harboring hatred in my heart, am I going to be able to ever be an example uh, to people to find the gospel message that has set me free, that has made me uh, not an enemy of God any longer, but an ally of God, a brother uh, to Christ and a child of God. Praying for our enemies encourages us to act in loving ways towards those even who will wrong us. Romans chapter 12 is, is a great place for us to turn. In fact, let's turn our Bibles there for just a moment. In Romans chapter 12, we get some interesting instruction here because he says, I, I want you to bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be haughty, but associate with the lowly. Never be wise in your own sight. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought. Remember, part of what happens when I'm praying for my enemies is this changing my perspective on how I see them. Give thought is what he says here. We'll look at back in verse 17. Repay no one evil for evil, but give thought to do what is honorable in the sight of all. If possible, so far as it depends on you, live peaceably with all. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, says the Lord. And here's our practical advice in Romans 12. To the contrary, don't seek revenge. Look at what he says. Verse 20, to the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. Do not, overcome, uh, do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. In this particular situation, if we, if we will pray for our enemies, not react to our emotions, and I have the, acron the uh, acrostic up there of star, stop, think, act, and then react. So your initial reaction, you may want to react on emotion. You're very hurt. Stop and think about why you're hurt and what's going on there. Maybe even remove yourself from the situation until you can calm down. Then act. And then react. Then come back and, and think about what, what went on in that conversation or what happened in that situation. And as far as it's up to me, as far as it depends on me and my part, well, I'm going to try to live peaceably with all men. And here's what happens when we'll pray for our enemies and pray for good for our enemies. Not that they're going to succeed in, in coming against us. That's not what we're talking about or defeating us. That's not what we're talking about. We want them to turn to God. We want them to change. We want to be reconciled to them. We don't want enemies in life as Christians. And praying for our enemies, here's one of the things that it does. It releases us from being imprisoned by them. If we harbor bitterness, if we harbor hatred in our hearts, it's like drinking poison that you mixed yourself. That's what happens. Over and over again in Scripture, we're finding that God says, hey, pray for people that persecute you. We're not praying for them to win their persecution. We're praying for them to change. Luke 6 and verse 27, which is a parallel to Matthew 5, reminds us that we should love our enemies and do good to those that hate us. And that's a hard thing to do. It's not an easy thing to do, but like I said, God doesn't always ask us to do the easy thing. He asks us to do the right thing. But as we continue on, we come back in verses 6 and 7 of our, our Psalm 4. Uh, as we look in verse 6, he says, There are many who say, Who will show us some good? Lift up the light of your face upon us, O Lord. You have put more joy in my heart than they have when their grain and wine abound. And in this, this case, the author c comes back and in his prayer, he steps back and he says, "But I, I want to I remember what God has done. I want to remember the purpose uh, for which I'm praying to God. And it's not just about you know, my enemies. It's not just about finding peace per se. It's, the, it's remembering the purpose of who God is and, and why He is, is sharing, why He has shared all His goodness with me. And he gives this picture in the beginning. Now, some translations, by the way, carry this with a negative tone from the previous verses. And most scholars say, no, there's, there's a change in attitude here to where... He's not saying, where are you, God, or what good stuff is going to be coming, because that's really what's being said by the people around him. It says, who will show us some good? They're looking for something good, right? So their question might have a negative context to it of, you know, where is good? Where is good in this world? Maybe that's what you're asking right now. And so the psalmist comes back and he says, I know where I can find goodness. 
He says, here's what I find. Lift up the light of your face upon us, O Lord. God's showing His face to someone, so to speak. And of course, no one has seen the face of God, but the, the idea of God turning Himself to someone, His light shining on them, is the concept that we see in Scripture on a couple of occasions that is really like a sign of Him favoring a person. So He's saying, you know, these people are asking to see good. God, show them good. You show them good because I know that you are good. I know that you are a good, good father. When the psalmist is reminded of God's favor, there's a renewal, there's a revival in him that you can almost sense in the writing of this psalm. As he prays before God, he's prayed for his enemies. And now he comes back and he says, and they're, they're just pressing me. You know, what, what good thing is there? And I'm telling him God is good. God is good. Psalm 31, 16. May your, make your face shine up on your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. Referring to God. Please, God, show your favor to me. So what do we do for those of us who just know in our hearts that God shines His favor upon His children? Well, we take that and we seek to be a reflection of that light, right? Matthew chapter 5. Again, we go back to the Sermon on the Mount in verse 14. You are the light of the world. God has shined His favor upon us as Christians. We've been reconciled. We've been restored. Uh, we are His children. We are His representatives. And so He says, You are the light of the world. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on a stand. And it gives light to all in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to to your Father who is in heaven. See, when you put Romans 12 and doing good to even the people that have persecuted you and heaping coals on their head by doing good to them, you're praying for those people and loving enemies that even persecute you. The idea is that as God is shining His favor on you for doing what you're supposed to do, it may end up reflecting some of that light into the lives of people who need it the worst. People who are living in a great deal of darkness and you happen to be experiencing that darkness from them, the very way that you're living your life might shine some light into their darkness. That's not going to happen 100% of the time because people make their own choices, and we have to realize that. But our responsibility is to pray for those people, to respond in a Christ-like manner, and to be those who are seeking to reflect the light of Jesus Christ into dark situations. That's our job can't control what they do and how they respond, but I can control what I'm doing. As we come to the very end of this psalm uh, tonight, in verse 8 he says, in peace. And I love that. He's, he's saying, after all this, I've worked through this. And again, this is that human element, so to speak, of this psalm, that he's, he's had to work through that. And if you've ever really had a, a difficult situation, you know the, the roller coaster that you can go on, even in prayer to God about a situation, about a person that is testing your faith, that is, that is you're struggling to, you know, to even be in the same room with, that that can be a roller coaster prayer with God to say, I can't believe that they're doing this and turn it in the same frame, but God, I, I, I don't want horrible things for them. I don't wish horrible things, but I wish that this situation could be resolved. It's a roller coaster. And yet at the end of this, the psalmist says, when I lay my head down at night, when I go to sleep, in peace, I will both lie down and sleep. For you alone, O oh Lord, make me dwell in safety. I love this. In peace. He says, at the end of all this, I am going to lay my head down in peace. A good night's rest can be had by those who will rest in the Lord. Now, again, there may be some other underlying issues as to why we lose sleep and, and more serious things. And sometimes we need to go talk to somebody about things. Because simply talking to ourselves or trying to work through it as an individual is, is not helping. And so we need some outside help. And there's nothing wrong with that. And go seek that medical attention or, or that counseling, whatever it is that you might need to help deal with that situation. Don't do that alone. But my hope is that along the way, we're going to make sure that we're including God in this process. And understanding that He can bring a peace to us that surpasses understanding. Philippians chapter 4, verse 7, as we talk about that peace that surpasses understanding, but you're not going to have that if you're not coming to God, right? Bringing all your anxieties before Him, that we are trusting Him, we're making supplication before Him, we are praying before Him with thanksgiving in our hearts. If we're approaching Him constantly in that prayer, 
That's part of the place that I'm going to find that healing. I'm going to find that safety. And then, at night, even when I struggle, even when I'm praying to God and I'm not even sure what to say, as I struggle through that prayer with God, I can know that I'm going to have a peace. I'm going to have peace. And hopefully that will lead to a more restful sleep and more rest eternally uh, speaking. So we think about this uh, tonight. I, I can't help but think of something I learned just recently. Um, maybe a year ago, I think Sally and I were out somewhere. I don't know if it was Lowe's or we were just out at some store and we saw this plant. And I've told you our, our, our track record with plants. It's horrible. And we saw this plant. It was a really, really pretty plant. It was like, you know, an indoor plant of some kind. And we were like, hey, that's really pretty. Let's take that home and try not to kill it. And it's actually done very well, but I, we didn't have a clue what it was called. The little tag that, you know, was supposed to be in the little, you know, pot there with it, it wasn't there. And so we were like, oh, okay, well, let's just buy it. It's pretty and see how long it lasts. Well, the other day I, I uh, downloaded this app called Picture This, and it's, it's a, like a plant identifier, a disease identifier in plants. And I thought, well, maybe this will help me not kill so many plants. Um, and so I downloaded it and I thought, well, I'm going to take a picture of this plant. And it'll, you'll take a picture and it will search this huge database and then give you an answer of what kind of plant it is. And it amazed me when it came up with the answer because the answer is it's called the prayer plant. And you can see a picture of it there. It's called the prayer plant. And there's any number of reasons it's called that. It has other names too. But I, I, of course, I honed in on that because I'm studying for this lesson. I'm like, what is that? The other thing about it is, is this. Almost all through the day, it'll kind of be droopy. You know, it, it, it's, it's not the, the prettiest of, of plants as far as when it droops, but especially kind of at the height of the day, it'll kind of get a little bit droopy, and we're thinking, well, it needs more water. It's actually part of the natural reaction of this plant because in the evening times, and this is what's really cool about this and really cool about what God does with His creation, in the evening times, those leaves will stand straight up. And the reason it's called the prayer plant is because that evening stance gives the, the impression that the plant is praying. Now, the plant is not praying, okay, but how cool is it to think that in the evening time, and in the evenings only, and that's the picture I have, that's actually our plant, and Sally was like, well, you should take a picture of that plant if you're going to use it, and I was like, oh, no, I probably have missed the window, but last night as I was finishing up studying for this lesson, I looked over, and guess what? That plant was standing straight up, so I took a couple of pictures of it. What if... What if we ended every single day praying ourselves to sleep? That's my challenge to you for the rest of the week. That at, when you get in bed at night, no matter how much of a struggle it is, I want you to pray yourself to sleep. Don't say just a prayer and be like, in Jesus' name, amen, and you're done. I want you to pray to the point, and you meditate on Scripture, maybe on this passage in particular, you meditate on a situation, asking God to help with it, working through the scenarios, talking to God, maybe even thinking about how you would approach this situation, what you're going to do tomorrow about it, pray yourself to sleep. And maybe, like the psalmist, we'll be able to lie down and have a little bit better night's rest. Because we went into our restful state, trusting God, praying to Him, and resting our souls with Him. I hope this study of this psalm tonight has given you some, some peace, maybe during a, a tumultuous time, a, a difficult time, maybe a time where it's hard to find good rest. I'm not saying that this is the answer to, to breaking your insomnia, okay? We've talked about that a couple of times. But my hope is that in those times where we do struggle, that perhaps this will help a little bit with the anxiety and increase our trust in the God who wants us to have an eternal rest with Him and to look forward to that day. Let's finish tonight with a prayer. Father, we thank You so much for allowing us to study tonight together and study in this particular psalm. Father, we're in a, in a, a part, a time in our lives where things are, are pretty stressful. We'll just have to admit it. This pandemic has us on edge to some degree and that, that kind of raises the level of stress in so many ways and so many circumstances. And that, Father, things that, that typically would be small in nature seem to keep blowing up on us. And, Father, perhaps even many of us are losing sleep over these very things. We pray, Father, for rest. We pray that we will trust you more. We pray that, that you will help us to ease our anxiety level as we trust in your holy word, as we trust 
in your good promises. Father, we know that, that just by talking to you many times, it helps to ease our burdens. And we pray, Father, that's what it will do. Father, in these evenings, as we pray ourselves to sleep, we pray that as we do that, that we'll have a sense of comfort, that we, we will have a calm, a, a peace that surpasses understanding in this world. And that, Father, it will cause us to rise up in the morning and to be those who are so ready and excited to reflect the light of Jesus in our lives that we just can't wait to do it. Thank you, Father, so much for your Son, who is that light who has come into the world and has shed light, Father, to help us to have understanding of how to have a relationship with you. And Father, it is in his name that we pray. Amen. Hope that you will have a blessed rest of the week. And I hope that as you find those blessings that God is bringing into your life, that you will seek to be a blessing to those around you. Because, let's be honest, right now, most people around us, they need some blessing. You can be the answer to that. Have a great rest of the week. God bless.